Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and today we're looking at e safety for kids. We're going to be joined by Kayleen Kerr, who is a body safety, cyber safety, and pornography education specialist. So please welcome from Perth uh, and, and e safe kids, Kayleen Kerr. Kayleen, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for the invitation, Chris. It's great to be here. Wonderful. And, you know, I've been monitoring your work. We're both ex WA police. Uh, and we crossed paths while you were still there uh, as well. I think you were in the community engagement division at that period. Oh, I remember um, now. It does go um, back. Yeah, I don't think I've ever worked in any community oh. engagement, but maybe detective life, perhaps. I'm not ah, sure. Okay. Well, I know yeah. that we've crossed paths, that's for yeah. sure. So, yeah, we're both detectives. There we go. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you're a body safety, cyber safety, and pornography education specialist. And you're still relatively early from a career transition. And I think that's also an interesting thing, uh, being ex-police, coming into running your own business. Um, so I don't know really where to start. But our focus here today is the work that you are currently doing with eSafe Kids. Yeah, over to your story and the journey and what's kind of brought you here, because you're doing some really great work. Yeah, I guess um, before I talk maybe about the work I'm doing and why I'm doing it and the, the passion behind it, um, it's probably helpful to go back a little bit in time. And, and really, um, my story started 25, 26 years ago. Um, after I left high school, I went off to uni and I studied a degree that was a combination of law, psychology and criminology. I was always really fascinated by why people do what they do. Um, at that time, though, the only thing I wanted to do um, was to be a police officer, to be a detective. Um, it was my goal since I was um, in year three at school. My mum still has the picture that I drew of me as a police yeah. officer. Um, I was going to go on and do a law degree, um, but I was accepted to WA Police. Um, and I ended up staying for uh, just about 21 years. I spent 18 wow. years working as a detective. I've worked in the metropolitan area and in regional WA. Um, a lot of my career was spent investigating child sexual abuse and exploitation, sexual assault and violence, um, and lots of other things in between as well. Yeah. Um, and I think um, over the years, that's where the, the passion for proactive prevention education came from. My Predominantly, my whole working life was dealing with people, um, families, communities after harm had already occurred. Um, and I was just thinking back earlier, back in about 2004, um, I was working at the Child Abuse Squad and it was the beginning of um, the emergence of issues in schools around cyber safety and children's online activity. Um, and every now and then uh, one of us detectives would be asked to go and speak to a group of school students. And to be honest, I did everything I could to avoid going and speaking to them. Because I was like, oh, that's not my job. I'm, I'm a detective. I want to investigate crime. I don't want to talk to kids yeah. about it, um, and which makes me laugh now because fast forward and I absolutely love talking to children and young people um, about having safe and positive experiences online. Um, and perhaps more than that, I really enjoy um, supporting and hopefully inspiring the trusted adults in children's lives to tackle what can sometimes be these really sensitive and challenging topics. Um, so, yeah, I've actually been out of WA Police now, officially resigned in November 2021. Um, I had been on leave without pay for um, two years prior to that. Uh, and I had been doing secondary employment when I was still working as a detective. Um, and that was in the not-for-profit sector. Um, that yeah. was solely proactive prevention education. It's, so, it's yeah. A good, yeah, so that's, uh, I suppose, any, any police listening, it's a good transition to do it that way, you don't have to just uh, resign. I did 15 yeah. years and I think 18 years, it's a good run. And I think it's, you build a lot of body of knowledge just in terms of from the offender and the criminal justice system side. Uh, but obviously how many years were you at the child abuse unit? Cause I think we would have crossed paths. I would have been at uh, major crime around that period. Yeah, so um, first time I did some jobs at Child Abuse Squad was 2004 and then uh, back in 2006, 2007 as well. Um, and then towards the end of my career, and then sexual crimes um, throughout your career um, from sort of, you know, the year, early 2000s upwards. Um, my last role with WA Police was at the Detective Training School as an instructor, so right. teaching sex offence law and investigation yeah. um, and still quite actively involved with what sort of um, matters Child Abuse Squad and the Sex Assault Squad were investigating. Yeah, so it brings a lot of experience uh, in particularly to the field that you've got. Now, your business is East Safe Kids and it's hard to call it a business. It's almost, yeah, how, do, how are you approaching 
yeah. it. Uh, and uh, you've got the, your tagline there, Educate, Equip and Empower. Uh, you, uh, yeah, where, where are you at now, six months in, kind of now that you've been out into the private sector? And what's your vision here? Yeah, so, um, I, yeah, I don't ever call it or think of it as a business at all, yeah. although I guess technically that is what it is. Um, I consider it a social enterprise um, yeah. because I, I do this work. And uh, over the years, a lot of this work um, in the not-for-profit sector, probably 80% of my work was unpaid. Um, so I do a lot um, that is unpaid or behind the scenes, yeah. and that is predominantly my advocacy work. So working really hard um, in, in different sectors to to ensure that our children and young people um, and those that live with them, work with them, are supported in keeping them safe. Um, so, yeah, I've been eSafe Kids now on my own for a, just a coming up to two years. Um, it's interesting because I've always worked with um, teams of people uh, and I'm, yeah. I am an extrovert, um, but I've got a, a fantastic network of um uh, people that are working in the same or similar spaces to me around me. I, I never really think of people as competitors. I think of um, people as people I can collaborate with. And yeah. I think ultimately we're all working towards a pretty similar goal. And that is um, assisting our children and young people to have more safe and respectful, um, positive experiences um, in the online space and the real world as well. Um, so I'm actually really enjoying it. Um, there's never enough hours in the day and mostly because I'm constantly wanting to create free content to support parents but um yeah do the best that i can with the, the time that i have yeah i mean i found i come out with the same mindset uh, that i had but again you without the the uh, the sort of the straddles that keep you behind and the bureaucracy that sometimes uh policing you have to deal with and you're a little bit more free to make your own decisions what, what's your vision here and i think you've built just and i'm looking at the title there body safety cyber safety and pornography education how have you how have you gone about building the curriculum i suppose if you if you've built it that way yeah, so I guess um, really uh, the, the place that I really started was protective behaviours and body safety education. That was something that I um, that I learned about over 20 years ago um, and being a sex crime detective for quite a long time, um, that was something that was incredibly important to me. So my, my and it's hard to say my number one passion, but my the driving force of my passion has always been um, the prevention of child sexual abuse and exploitation um, for children, both in the real world, but also in online environments, because I started investigating online um, harms to children in the sort of late 1990s and then into the through the 2000s. Um, so the protective behaviours and body safety is really the foundation of the work that I do. And um, on my website, you'll find that a lot of the resources I have, they're all um, primary school child friendly and a lot of them around body safety. Um, and then what happened over um, time, and I'm going back probably eight to 10 years ago, in thinking about sexual crimes against children, something that consistently started to emerge um, was um, children's access and exposure to pornography. Um, and also um, the ubiquitous nature of the internet, the portable electronic devices that children were using from increasingly younger ages meant that I couldn't talk about body safety without talking about cyber safety. And I couldn't talk about either of those without talking about pornography. So yeah. they are incredibly different topic areas but also entirely complementary um, so everything that I do is um, is working off a foundation of um, all children having a right to be safe and to feel safe whether that's online or offline um, and supporting children to do that um, and our kids and young people have so much to navigate today yeah. um, that just wasn't even an issue for, our, for for many of us that are parenting um, I grew up before the internet I didn't have access to the internet until I went to university so my brain was was a bit more developed and I was out of the, those um, young young person years um, but I'm a mum as well I've got um, a son that's about to turn 13 and one that's about to turn 15 right. um, and uh, I started talking to them about cyber safety and digital well-being um, before uh, you know they started year one at school so um, I think that I've had that unique perspective of seeing the immense benefits of technology and there are immense benefits but also seeing some of the risks um, and so my work has been built off a foundation of, of thinking that 
you don't know what you don't know, particularly as a parent or carer. And when people know better, they can do better. Um, and so what I always wanted to do was um, to provide that sort of bridge between what children and young people are experiencing online um, and then supporting parents and carers to step into that space so that they can work to keep their children safe, but also to encourage them to have a positive relationship with their child around their use of technology. Because so often when parents or even educators are talking to kids about technology, we're talking about the negatives, we're talking about the things that can go wrong or have gone wrong, and it just sets up this really negative space. So the end result of that is children and young people, when they are harmed or in unsafe situations, they're not talking to trusted adults. Um, they're, they're so scared of getting in trouble, having devices confiscated, yeah. and because of um, some of the content, particularly the more hypersexualized or violent content they're coming across, it is uncomfortable and awkward embarrassing to talk to a trusted adult um, and I think that we need to change that and that's really been um, sort of the focus of my work is supporting and inspiring those trusted adults in children's lives to step into these challenging kind of tricky and sensitive topics. Yeah I've got a couple of ones of how I suppose one is where are you finding the real sort of age groups that this really kicks in well with? I've noticed you've been doing some sort of more community groups and NFPs, but also getting into the schools as well. And then the other one is the national narrative we've seen over sort of the last 12 or 18 months in terms of uh, women issues and consent. And, you know, this follows, tends to follow women throughout their, their life, their life journey. They have to sort of, and I noticed with the body safety uh, aspect that you've added to your specialist role, um, how do you see this in a, at a national curriculum and what we're treat, you know, teaching kids? And I don't know if you've met Julian and Grant, the e-safety commissioner, but she's a really, you know, real advocate here too. But are you seeing enough? Do you think there's enough in our school curriculum at an early age yet or, it's, or you're seeing it coming through? Yeah, so um, if you'd asked me that question eight, nine years ago, um, it really didn't exist. And what did exist was a little bit hit and miss. Um, and very often, if we go back sort of eight years ago, I would say education around cyber safety, um, pornography wasn't being spoken about back yeah. then. If we talk about cyber safety, it tended to be sort of block and ban. It was, um, I found it quite fear mongering and scare tactics used. And that's something that I work really hard not to do. Yeah, we have to talk about the risks, but we need to talk about the strategies as as well um, and come to it with a more positive mindset. So um, I've watched over the, the last few years and I would say the last four or five years particularly, um, there has been a huge improvement in education being provided um, in schools. Um, there's a curriculum to support schools um, and there are a lot of other organisations working in the cyber safety space that have um, developed some fantastic curriculum and resources to support um, schools and parents and carers. Um, and I'm, I'm always sharing that with other people. Um, so yes, I think we're in a much better place. Um, sometimes I do think that um, curriculum that's delivered in schools, um, if we think about the bar or the level at which they come in, it's, it's down here. Um, and oftentimes it's sometimes misaligned with the actual experiences of our children and young people. So I think there's still work to be done. Um, specifically your questions around um, consent, and I wonder if you're um, referring to the pornography work there. Um, pornography, uh, I first went into a secondary school to speak to young people about porn um, about eight years ago, um, and I've been doing that ever since. At that time, there was no one in WA and very few people around Australia or internationally that were uh, really aware of what was happening in terms of the, the access and exposure um, to pornography for our children and young people. Um, so that's something I'm really passionate about. Now, in relation to pornography, that is not being addressed in schools. Um, the relationship and sexuality education or the respectful relationship education that's delivered in most schools um, is... Uh, inclined to be more of a sex education as opposed to the relationships and sexuality part of it. Um, and even when they are talking um, or introducing conversations around consent, respectful relationships, etc., it's almost always an absence of a conversation around pornography. And I think that we are going to be unsuccessful in addressing um, the rise in sexual assault and violence, harassment, um, and so on, if we don't actually address um, the very significant influencer of mainstream pornography 
pornography. In Australia, the average age that children are being exposed to porn now is getting anecdotally reported as between 8 and 10 years of age. And in fact, I get contacted by way more primary school teachers and parents than I do secondary school. Kids it's for the are... boys too, right? It's, this is not just a girl safety issue. This is just a young person issue. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. This is an issue for um, all children, um, all of our children. Um, and yeah, we're just we're just not addressing it. And I understand why, because, um, you know, who wants to talk about pornography? And if I do, how do I even do that? But it's just so incredibly necessary. And what I've found is that um, young people are very, very open to a conversation. Um, if it is, um, it's got to be accurate. It's got to be evidence based. Um, it needs to be comprehensive. It needs to be inclusive, shame free, um, and listening to the experiences of our young people. Um, they've got a lot to say, and they're very open to this education. But to be honest, if we're starting this education in secondary school, we are starting too late. Um, so I developed a session for parents of primary school age children, um, sort of from scared to prepared, because um, we don't want to be starting the conversation at porn um, at all. If you have the luxury of time, we want to go back and we want to um, talk to children about you know, their protective behaviours and body safety and respectful relationships. But we're talking about friendships, um, social norms and gendered stereotypes and growth and development. There's so many foundational conversations and competencies that we can teach our children so that when we need to discuss um, sexual relationships or pornography, the foundations have been laid. Um, oftentimes we just arrive at these conversations too late and we say far too yeah. little. Yeah. How do you structure, you, you do, how are you doing it in terms of, are you doing a workshop or is it a one hour talk or how are you structuring it to sort of break down some of those barriers? Because you say, because if you're doing secondary school, it might be too late. Yeah, so I guess um, supporting parents and carers actually is the, the focus of my work um, predominantly now. And the reason for that is that any education that's delivered in the school, like ideally, the conversation actually starts in the home and then yeah. anything that's being delivered at school can then be supported in the home. So I actually think parents and carers are the biggest missing piece of the puzzle. So that's who I really focus on now. Um, so I do workshops from a couple of hours and I do full day professional development as well for those working with children and young people. Um, and I've created an, a free part on um, community on my website where I put lots of resources to support parents in those conversations. Um, if I'm talking to kids in primary school, I don't have specific conversations about pornography and I don't use the word pornography. Um, it usually sits within a protective behaviours lesson or um, cyber safety and digital wellness. Um, and then with secondary school students, um, I do um, direct delivery sessions to them. But I'm also very mindful is I might get an hour or two with a group of young people and I'm very clear with schools that that is not enough. Um, a one-off presentation um, uh, that might be a tick in the box is it's not effective and I would rather actually not deliver them than than it be that. I'm happy for it to be the start of conversation and education or maybe um, to be building off something that's already happening, but it shouldn't just be a standalone, you know, conversation about porn or cyber safety or whatever it is and, and then go tick, we've done that because we yeah. haven't and we're doing our young people a huge disservice if we do it in that way. That was part of my thinking is how are you finding the differentiation between the schools, religious schools versus government schools, uh, you know, and, and even the breakdown of the different religions. Uh, some just won't even, they'll prefer to have their head in the sand. Uh, so I would say, and I'm um, thinking about the, the schools that I say, schools particularly that I work with, I probably work with an equal amount of government and non-government. So your public and private, um, different religious denominations um, in their um, metro area, regional, um, uh, in WA, but also interstate, um, internationally. Um, so I see that um, a lot of schools are engaging in the conversation. Um, but what I do find is it only tends to to come in secondary school. Um, and what I think is that we're, we're leaving that too late. Sure. Um, and I think that pornography can be quite a polarising topic as well. And a lot of parents will say it's, I don't think it's necessarily burying their head in the sand 
entirely. Um, sometimes I think it's a case of parents just don't even know the nature of mainstream pornography and how accessible it is. And if they do, they kind of in their head go, well, that's not something I need to consider just yet. So I'll get to it, but I'll get to it later. So yeah. invariably what happens is they don't get there. Um, and that is kind of consistent across all schools. Um, I've also done some work in recent years um, in for other countries. Um, so in the Middle East and, and countries that are quite different to Australia. Um, that are having very similar issues around their children and young people's exposure to pornography and they are addressing it. Um, sometimes we've just got to um, tweak the way in which we address yeah. things depending on the setting. But um, any education that's being delivered to children or young people um, needs to be localised um, and you need to take into consideration that group of children and young people wherever you are um, in, in the world um, and make sure that what you're delivering um, is, um, is going to be right for them. Yeah. Look, it sounds like you're doing some great work. How do you, I suppose the last question, how do you, how do you now transition out? Because obviously the work that you've done, you know, you've got some uh, horror stories potentially and, mm -hmm. and the like. Do you bring them in or do you find this is a new, new chapter for you and you don't uh, sort of refer back to that work or sometimes you can bring it up if you need to make a point? Yeah, sometimes I, I do use um, real world stories. I don't ever make anything up. I have got more stories that I could share than I wish I had, to be honest. Um, but I'll, I'll use them only not to scare and not for fear mongering, but to pull out the lessons um, and the learning. So in this scenario, um, what education could we have provided that child where before harm occurred, they identified they were in an unsafe situation or they were being asked to keep an unsafe secret, um, teaching kids strategies for in the moment and then after so that they can access help and support. So I'll only yeah. use stories um, in that way. I don't use them to scare parents or for fear mongering because I just, I, I don't think that's a good thing to be doing. Um, yeah. And um, it's interesting because I got into this work at a time in my, my working career where I just could not deal with hearing another horror story or being involved in another case where a child had been harmed. Um, and I wanted to take a break. And I was asked to work in this proactive prevention educa um, education space a couple of years prior to actually starting. And at that time, I just said, no, I don't want to have anything to do with um, anything that involves harm of children. And what I've actually found is doing this work for me has been incredibly therapeutic. Um, and for me, it's actually really positive. I still have so many horror stories in my head, as I'm sure that um, many people in law enforcement and other services have. Um, but I'm trying to take that and channel that in positive ways. Um, and very frequently, people will talk about um, the passion that I have for this. And I... Yeah. I that comes across naturally. It's not anything that needs to be put on because when you have seen the worst of the worst, you would do anything you possibly can to ensure that no child um, is in an unsafe situation. Um, and the reality is I've had to accept that I'm not going to be able to protect all children from harm, but I hope that each and every one of us can play some role in making that happen. Yeah. Well, look, uh, as I was about to, you know, your passion uh, was in the back of my mind in terms of saying it, and I can see it. Uh, we're obviously connected online and I, I'm monitoring your work. Um, one final thing is the the national framework. We mentioned the e-safety commissioner. You're there in Perth. Um, are you finding there is a sort of a national uh, framework for you to plug into? Are you finding getting the, enough support or everything else is going fine. Where, where would you find any particular gaps or pros and cons uh, from the framework that you see nationally? You know, I think it's um, certainly from when I started in this place where none of that existed at all and it was kind of almost the Wild West, really. People could yeah. do what they wanted, how they wanted. Um, I think we've um, particularly um, the e-safety commissioner um, under the leadership of Julie Inman Grant. Um, I have just seen that organisation evolve over the last few years. Um, I love the work that the office is doing. Um, I think that um, the frameworks that are in place now are, are very accessible and known to those of us working um, in the space in terms of ensuring that we are working in a um, research-informed or evidence-based way. Um, so I actually think that's really accessible. Um, I think that we are definitely making um, 
positive steps in the right direction um, in terms of uh, like, you know, protecting children from um, pornography online. We had a Senate inquiry um, not that long ago, which re resulted in the Protecting the Age of Innocence report that the Australian government supported. Um, and now the eSafety Commissioner is actually working towards a roadmap for potential implementation. So there's lots and lots of things that are occurring um, at the moment the, the frustration, I guess, for me is that these things, and rightly so, um, they take time and yeah. they, they take years um, until we actually see the implementation. Um, and so what that means is in the interim, parents and carers and educators are the first and at the moment the last line of defence in protecting children. Um, and some of these issues are not new, um, but I feel like I've been talking about them for quite a while now. Um, and we're still we're still not where we need to be. Um, I think that the Australian government is doing the best that it can in very complicated global circumstances. Um, I think that big tech has clearly demonstrated that they are unwilling or unable to self-regulate their platforms and make them safe for children. Um, so I think things need to start at that level, um, and that is at an international level. It's probably um, it's certainly outside the bounds of Australia. We have um, legislation now um, that uh, will assist in, uh, in the Australian context, but it's really only this year that um, big tech companies and online service providers are actually starting to be held accountable for the content and lack of moderation on their platforms. But it's only at the moment that we have some class actions occurring in the United States against um, social media platforms and um, online pornography sites that we don't yet know the answers to. Yeah. Um, so I think we're going to have some pretty clear direction um, in the not too distant future. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of work to do still. Absolutely. And it is surprising that it's taken so long. Um, I'm just fortunate my kids have grown up. I just was in the right window. Uh, they just caught the tail end of it. But uh, yeah, no, it's been a, a fascinating sort of uh, journey in terms of that technology and how there's always that lag time before we really understand the full ramifications of some of it. And really, on, it is on our kids. Kaylin Kerr there in Perth with East Safe Kids. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great to catch up with you again and keep doing some great work. Just keep going. Thanks, Chris. Good on you.